This video is brought to you by Fantic. Wait, back. No, back. What is that? H3? Postulated to be in great supply there. What is H3? Helium-3. It's fusion without the nuclear reactors, an unlimited source of energy, extremely valuable and easy to transport back to Earth. One cargo hold full could power the United States for an entire year. Helium-3. What's that science fiction in real life? I can make a good YouTube video. I think I'll do that. We're all familiar with helium. It's that odorless, tasteless gas that makes balloons float and makes your voice sound funny if you breathe it in. Helium is actually the second most abundant element in the universe, right after hydrogen. But the helium we're used to is actually a particular helium isotope or variation called helium-4, being that it has two neutrons and two protons. Helium-4 is really the only version of the element we experience here on Earth making up roughly 99.99986% of the planet's entire helium supply. Unfortunately, this Earth-abundant version of helium isn't the version that's making headlines. Instead, the golden child is a separate isotope, helium-3. Like helium-4, helium-3 also has two protons. Obviously, otherwise it wouldn't be helium. But instead of two neutrons like helium-4, it has one. This primordial variation dates back all the way to our planet's infancy, forming in the mantle between the Earth's core and crust. These days, however, this particular helium isotope is extremely hard to come by on the planet. Helium-3 comes mostly from solar winds, but because the Earth is protected by our atmosphere and our magnetosphere, these solar winds don't really trickle down to us. One scientific report shows that only roughly 0.01 metric tons of helium-3 exist on Earth and it comprises only 0.001% of the United States helium reserves, which I didn't even know we had a helium reserve. Is that for like when the president needs to make balloon animals as a matter of national security? No one knows. Helium-3 can come from other sources, in particular the decay of tritium used in thermonuclear warheads. However, unlike the Earth, the moon has no atmosphere. As a result, it has accumulated massive amounts of helium-3 over billions of years. Back in 1986, as people were rocking acid wash jeans and listening to Genesis, scientists discovered that the moon's soil, called regolith, contained over 1 million tons of helium-3. Of course, at the time, space travel was far too expensive to just send a bunch of crews up to dig around in the dirt. But since companies like SpaceX have brought the cost of spaceflight down exponentially over the last decade, many nations are now beginning to gaze up at the moon and see dollar signs. So what's the big fuss about helium-3? The main draw is as a potential fuel for nuclear fusion reactors. Today, the most common elements used in fusion reactors are hydrogen isotopes, deuterium, which has one neutron, and tritium, which has two. One major problem with these elements, though, is that during the fusion process, they release radioactive neutrons that can damage the containment vessel. Then there's the tritium itself, which is also radioactive, which makes it difficult to deal with and dangerous. Count the song Radioactive by Imagine Dragons. Helium-3 is also an element that can fuse with deuterium, creating only helium and charged protons as byproducts, with little to no radioactive particles. But the best part about helium-3 is the energy density. It's estimated that roughly 25 metric tons of this stuff, roughly 25% of the cargo capacity of a SpaceX Starship, would be enough to fuel the entire United States for a full year. Yeah, think about how many Tuba Da Vinci videos you could binge watch with that much energy. It's a truly amazing thought. According to the 2017 study from the Institute of Fusion Technology at the University of Wisconsin, the amount of energy generated by helium-3 could be up to 250 times greater than the amount of energy needed to fly to the moon, extract it, and send it back to Earth. This kind of power Power density has many researchers excited about the possibility of meeting the world's energy needs for centuries. Not to mention, scoring dibs on the moon's helium-3 reserves would mean billions of dollars for whoever controlled it. This is why for many nations, the moon is looking like a big old pot of gold. The only country that has made serious headway in mapping out the moon's helium-3 is China. This was actually a major plot point in the Netflix series Space Force. I'd say spoiler alert, but I don't think anyone actually watched that show. It's actually not that bad. It's, it's pretty good. So I'm clearly not on the moon, but we do a lot of video on site. And that's where our sponsor this week, Fantech, comes in. Let me show you how we shoot our videos. So 
This is a typical rig. We have a teleprompter, we have a screen, we usually have a Roku to cast information onto that screen. This is a 300 watt Fantec. This gives us the opportunity to record all day out here and not worry about losing power. And if you attach it to the accessory solar panel, we're currently charging 100 watts from the sun. So we are not just powering everything, but the battery is actually charging back up. So if you do any kind of outdoor activities, this thing is the perfect companion for all sorts of stuff. Whenever I get writer's block, my answer has always been a change of scenery. And with my Fantec portable power station and this, a mobile hotspot on my laptop, I can pretty much work from anywhere. Throw in the solar panel and I can do it day or night. So if you're curious about the Fantec portable power station, use the link in the description and use code 2 bit 300 to save $90 and you can even save $76 off the accessory solar panel as well. Huge thanks to Fantech and to you for supporting the show. China's Chang'e 4 mission, launched in 2019, was sent out with the primary goal of locating and mapping out helium-3 deposits, positioning China to potentially corner the market on the moon. This could pose a pretty serious threat to U.S. national security. Monopolizing the moon's helium-3 would position China as the premier economic power. Not to be outdone, the U.S. nuclear corps, together with Solar Resource Corporation, has agreed to acquire 500 kilograms of lunar helium-3 between 2028 and 2032. Now that's that does sound like a plot from Space Force. However, the nuts and bolts of the mission, such as how and when they would go up and exactly what they would be mining for, has yet to be worked out. Even India is getting into the action. The Chandrayaan-2 space probe is also set to land on the lunar surface in the near future, with one of its objectives being to locate helium-3. But as these nations shoot for the moon, both literally and figuratively, are they really gearing up to just shoot themselves in the foot? That's where things get interesting. See, while helium-3 holds enormous potential, it's questionable whether we could actually reach that potential. Theoretical physicist Frank Close says that the whole helium-3 fusion concept is pure moonshine. According to Close, deuterium reacts up to 100 times more slowly with helium-3 than it does with tritium. This would require much higher melting temperatures. In this process, Close says, the deuterium would be more likely to fuse with itself, thus forming tritium anyway, and end up reacting as it would in a conventional <laughs> nuclear reactor. Gerald Kolchinsky, director of the Institute of Fusion Technology at the University of Wisconsin, says that the energy required for a deuterium-helium-3 reactor would be be roughly two to three times higher than the standard deuterium tritium reactors. And that's just in a conventional fusion reactor such as ITER, the international fusion project underway in France. We've done an entire fusion reactor episode, which you can check out here. ITER will weigh three times as much as the Eiffel Tower and reach temperatures of 150 million degrees centigrade, about 10 times hotter than the sun's core. A similar design for helium fusion would need to be even bigger and require even higher temperatures. Higher temperatures than the sun. Just think about that. What could possibly go wrong? One of the biggest issues right now is that very few people on Earth have successfully made a viable fusion reactor with a net power output using conventional methods. If a helium-3 reactor is even possible, it's likely, you guessed it, 30 years away or more. As of right now, there's not even a guarantee that there's enough helium-3 that could be mined from the moon to elicit any serious study into the isotope as a fusion fuel. While the element is abundant on the moon, it still resides within the moon's soil. Extracting it would require a process of scooping it up and then separating it into the useful elements and then storing it for later use. If you've watched our video on nouveau mon graphite, which we can link here, you know that even high concentrations of an element could only be about 5% and require huge amounts of energy and processes to refine to high pure concentrations. Still, even outside of energy applications, helium-3 could prove vital in a number of other spaces, in particular for use in MRI machines as a way of helping doctors examine patients' lungs. So what's the verdict? At this point, it's really hard to say. While we all love the idea of fusion energy and certainly hope to see it realized eventually, our planet is in a really precarious position right now. While a helium-3 reactor could hold loads of major potential, we're going to have to see major strides in both nuclear fusion and space mining and refining infrastructure before it can actually ever truly be realized. But what do you think? Does the promise of Helium-3 justify the heavy investment it will take to acquire it, refine it, bring it back to Earth, and then put it into a fusion reactor? Or are we better off exploring other more proven energy solutions? Sound off in the comments below. All right, before we go, 
quick, let's take a moment and talk about our favorite comments of the week. All right, this is a short but sweet one, and it comes from our heat pump video we did on why heat pump heating could be more efficient than resistive heating. Um, David Pearson says, clickbait <laughs> uh, It is kind of true. We, we claim that this heat pump breaks the laws of physics. We were joking. What we meant to say is that the coefficient of performance of 500% could be better than that of a heater that is 100% efficient. Anyways, go check out that video here. Finally, for our second comment of the week, this is about our iron air battery video, which we'll have a link to here. Sky Trekker says, if you can run car on rust, my old Astra will be free energy forever. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm not sure that's exactly how a rust battery works, but just maybe. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon.